Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 107. We are going deep undercover with, if you like code names, try out these games. to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at Dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Daniel. Welcome to the episode, everyone. We're so glad to have you join us again this week. Not only do we have an excellent episode because we're talking about the fan favorite code names and what games you should try out after you play, but also we got Daniel back. Welcome back, Daniel. Glad to be back. It's good to be settled down again after all that moving. So why don't you tell everybody what happened and where you're at right now? All right. Well, so I have moved in with my wife down in Birmingham, Alabama, so that's where I am now. It was several iterations of moving stuff from New York down to Birmingham, back and forth, and then visiting family for various necessities. Long story short, I haven't been in the same state for more than two weeks at a time for uh, since the beginning of June. Probably won't be until mid-October, so yay. I'm so tired. <laughs> I am so tired. Sounds like the worst pickup and deliver game I've ever heard. No kidding. <laughs> I thought you lost you, man. I thought you got like one of those Vita bugs, were just rolling around the country. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't. The, the last thing I have on my mind right now is more driving. Yeah, it's good to be back, and I should be able to to recommit to the podcast on our regular schedule. So I'm looking forward to that. All of our RPG fans have been missing you, so it's really good to have you back. And we have a great episode for you. So on to the episode. <laughs> Shout it from the tabletops! <laughs> Sir, you're gonna need to get down from there. Alright, so we have a lot of news that we're shouting from the tabletop. Man, it's kind of hard to, to get a handle on all these craziness that's been going on. Um, Anthony, what do you have for us? What do you want to start off with with this one? Uh, I think the big news, the one everybody's been going on about, is the... Um... Daniel being back? Is that well, it? yeah, I mean... Alright, cool, cool. Do we have other news? I'm sorry. That's I, all I was going to talk is. about. What could be news <laughs> compared to compared to one of three people on a podcast returning? Like clearly, uh -huh. clearly, this is news of global significance. I got a text it, message. It, it, Daniel volunteered me. He said, "You're going to run the news, and it's all about me coming back." So that's all. Like, I haven't prepared <laughs> anything else. <laughs> you don't have that sonnet up and ready to go about Daniel. Well, I maybe I'll save it. I don't know. All right. <laughs> 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 all right so other than daniel being back uh, what else is going on in the board game real industry? news uh, i guess i could talk about that okay so the second biggest story of the last two weeks and that is the uh, end of the licensing deal between fantasy flight and games workshop if you spend any time on board game geek or facebook or in a gaming group or in a game store you've probably heard this just because a lot of people are freaking out a little bit because there are certain games that maybe they had been putting off purchasing and now we're like, oh, crud, I better find this before it costs $300. So guess what? Most of them now cost $300. Uh, <laughs> so if you haven't heard this yet, basically what happened is uh, Games Workshop had a deal with Fantasy Flight. Fantasy Flight published a lot of games that used the Warhammer 40K and Fantasy Universe. Those games included things like Forbidden Stars, big hit last year, Warhammer Adventure Card Game, Talisman, all those Talisman, you know, different modules and games and expansions. Those are all... Games Workshop uh, licensed. And the one that surprised me that I didn't realize was licensed from Games Workshop was Fury of Dracula. Um, and that seems to be the one most people are, you know, scrambling to find a copy of because it was so out of print for so long already. It's a very interesting thing. For gamers, this is the big deal. Like, ah, I'm not going to find this game. Or, ah, there's gonna, not going to be an expansion for this game I really like. Um, for the hobby, though, it's interesting because Games Workshop... <laughs> is not great at producing things at all. <laughs> so, like at any, they, everything's overpriced and the quality is meh and the rules are meh. Fantasy Flight did really, really good work with that license. So it's interesting to see them walk away from it. Whoever decided to walk away from it, we don't really know. And my big question is, will Fantasy Flight re-implement some of these games that are going to die off now into other themes? 
because that would be kind of cool. Be cool to see Forbidden Stars with any of their themes on it. Game of Thrones, Star Wars, whatever. So I don't know. I mean, are there any games that you guys saw on that list that you would scramble to pick up? Well, for me, I, I really was kind of getting around to picking up Forbidden Stars. I heard some great things about it. I love Twilight Imperium and to be able to have that universe in a more manageable format was something that I really wanted to get my hands on and now it's gone. So yeah, maybe the mechanics are fantasy flight mechanics. I'm not too sure about that, but if they are, we'll never see this combination together. And obviously Games Workshop has a a good number of great IPs and it's kind of a shame. I mean, even if they do kind of reskin this in a different way, I think that gamers in total, I think the bottom line is gamers are losing out here. Yeah, I think Forbidden Stars, at least, we will see again because that's a reskin of StarCraft. Um, they lost that license and then they redid it as Forbidden Stars. The real question is how long will sure. it take? And that's that'll be a tough one. So I'm with you. The one I was always looking at was Fury of Dracula, and I actually snagged one at the local sure. store here. I had some credit with them, so I grabbed one of their last copies. Uh, but, you know, it's it's tough. If you were looking for one of those games and then you didn't notice this right away, and now you're looking them up online, it's like $100, $150, $200 for some of these. Ah, you might be out of luck. Yeah, that's actually the kind of the situation I'm in right now because I've been traveling so constantly. I wasn't even aware this was happening. And so now I'm, you know, I'm finally settled down and looking, oh, so those are gone now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, well then, I guess I didn't really want those games then. It's okay. (laughs) Uh, so it will be interesting to see how these companies sort of, where they go now that 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 link is severed, right? Um, but it is sad to see a lot of, a lot of games essentially disappear overnight. Yeah, it is tough. I mean, the one thing I was wondering too is I wonder if any of this had to do with Fantasy Flight being saying like, hey, we're going to launch our own miniatures game. Uh Uh-huh. And Games Workshop's like, oh, no. (laughs) No, 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 no. We're not going to license to a competitor. Or if this had been in the works long before that. I mean, I guess we'll never know. But a lot of people were surprised. I was. So it'll be interesting to see where they both go from here. Yeah, I mean, Games Workshop's had a lot of changes in their structure recently, too, right? So they've stopped doing business as, like, they're they're stores. They've changed them over to, uh, to being Warhammer stores now, right? As opposed to to Games Workshop stores, there's some sort of rebranding going on. Yeah, I know they've changed a lot. They, they're releasing a lot of board games now, too, where for a long time they wouldn't publish anything. And in the last two years, they've released three or four. So maybe they're trying to get back in the board game space and they don't want to license their IPs to a competitor. I don't know. Uh, I, maybe that we don't really need Games Workshop anymore. Maybe we don't need that whole Warhammer universe. If we're going to produce our own products and we'll get more of the money, we don't have to share it. I mean, you can almost look at what's going on with DC and Marvel, or especially Marvel, where some of their comic book characters are owned by other film companies, so why produce those comic books? So, you know, we'll just produce our own thing. So don't produce X-Men, because they're owned by somebody else. Let's let's kind of build up in humans, and we'll do that, and, you know, we'll keep all of the revenue. So it's not too surprising that things are going this way as, as the industry kind of, you know, is flush full of money and kind of interest but once again it's sad because we're it seems like we're going to see this a lot more where companies are going to focus on single products and you're not going to have as much diversity as we once had now unfortunately that's not all we also have uh in the news aeg uh they've recently came out and said that they're kind of following along with asmoday they're not part of asmoday but they're going to be following along with asmoday's new policy as far as new minimum prices for their games so their games won't be able to drop below a certain price unless there are some special conditions on special games and they're going to have some restrictions for online game stores all of this is done in hopes to supporting the friendly local game store but at the same time it it's having impact throughout the industry and now we're seeing the effects of asmoday kind of being the big kid on the block setting a certain standard and other companies kind of following through and uh, definitely not the end of this happening. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not happy about this becoming the new way of things. I think, though, one thing that's been uh, happening a lot recently, and it's something that we've been kind of mourning, you know, the lo- loss of the friendly local game store, 
might actually work against this trend and that you're consolidating your business in a few big retailers, three of which are primarily or two of which are primarily online, rather, which is cool stuff and mini market. And then you've got your Barnes and Noble crowd. So I wonder if the retailers could push back eventually and just say, well, that's fine. We just won't sell your games anymore. Because if you're going to restrict our pricing policies, we can't guarantee we're going to get a profit or even be able to liquidate stock effectively. So, I mean, I guess part of it depends on what the extent of these controls are, right? Can you go on sale? Can you go on clearance uh, to get rid of something that isn't selling? Or if you buy one of their games, are you stuck with it forever because no one's going to buy it at full price and you're not allowed to discount it? Sure. And I think this was part of Asmodee's release originally when they were saying that the model was kind of changing to the fact where they weren't expecting or didn't want gamers to buy a large number of games, just a few games, probably at a higher price point. But the challenge that we all find as gamers is if you in fact don't have low price or discounted games, you really don't have any incentive to purchase the games that you know, as we know, have complex mechanics. So if I can't get a game at a cheap price, am I going to buy full MSRP or even slightly below that to hopefully find a gem in there? You know, I mean, the reason why the Barnes & Noble sales are so good is not just because of the prices, but it allows me to try out games that I normally wouldn't be able to try out or the online discounts are so beneficial because otherwise I'm never going to touch a heavy game because I don't know if it's good. And if I don't if if I don't have that little bit of, you know, kind of leeway there, it's not going to ever hit my table and it's never going to get known and it's never going to get picked up or gain steam in the industry. So I don't know. It's a catch 22 there. I I see what they're doing, but I think they might be, uh, you know, kind of off their nose to spite their face a little bit here. Yeah, it's tough because I feel like they have this master plan and it's there's no way you can control the market. In any situation, it's a capitalist system. Like it's gonna go as it goes. Like for example, you've got sites like Cool Stuff who every now and then will run a big sale on like one product line. Like it'll be X Wing or Armada or whatever it is, and they are able to discount it a little bit more than the ten or fifteen percent. And at least the people I know locally, they know this is happening now, and they'll wait to buy those things. So I was speaking to a local local game store owner here, and he said they don't sell any more of those than they used to, with the rare exceptions being you know, the the hot new wave that comes in, the people who always pre-order that, they'll come in and pre-order it. But they always would have done that anyways because they want it right away. So sure. I, I don't think you're necessarily helping the game stores in the way, like if that's quote unquote what they're doing. And at the same time, you know, like you're saying, who has the upper hand here with the retailers? You know, cool stuff in mini market maybe don't have enough leverage to go to Asmodee and be like, we're not going to carry your games because that's probably a lot of their sales. But Amazon and Barnes and Noble they probably have a lot more leverage. They could easily tell those companies, we're not going to carry your games. It's not going to hurt their bottom line. So it it does make you wonder how it's going to play out because, you know, anytime you try to control pricing like that, and especially if a lot of companies try try to do the same thing or like this strong handed way that they're trying to force people to buy through local game stores. Like we picked up terraforming Mars at Gen Con. And apparently there's promos that come with it. If you buy at the local game store only, like there's no other way to get them. And that's unfortunate for people who either don't realize that or just don't have a local game store near them. Uh, That kind of thing, it does start to feel almost exclusionary to people who don't have access to that resource. So where's the line? Where do you draw it? And when do people start pushing back on that? I I guess we'll find out in the next couple of years as this progresses because it's a trend that's not stopping. It's continuing. Yeah, I think you made a good point about people picking up the new waves of certain things. So maybe for your collectible games, maybe for your your living card games, maybe for your games where, maybe like Smash Up, where there's just multiple, multiple expansions that you either might want to get or have to get, or things like Armada or X-Wing Miniatures or Star Trek Attack Wing or Dungeons & Dragons Attack Wing, where if you're not a hardcore gamer in that area, and that's not your game, but maybe you are someone who's getting involved into it, or maybe you are a casual gamer in these type of tournaments. I know for me, playing some of those systems, if I'm not going to make that my game, the game for me, I'm going to be a gamer just about that, it's going to really dissuade me from getting involved in those competitions because 
I need to pick up those things when I need to pick up those things. I need to pick up those ships or those dragons when I need to pick those up. And if I'm waiting for that one day sale that may happen every three to four months, I'm probably not going to take part in those, you know, friendly local game store tournaments because, you know, it's not at the price point that I need. So I'm not going to be hardcore enough to buy it at almost MSRP. And I, I can't wait forever to get it on sale. So it actually might hurt them in the long term. So. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. We all want to support these companies and the designers, but fifteen, twenty dollars for like one ship in an X-wing system. It's true. It, it, if you need one, fine. But if you need three or four to field a new, like that's you're dropping a hundred bucks every three to four months. Not everybody can do that. Most people can't. So it's we do. A lot of people do rely on those discounts, and it's not saying all games should be discounted and this is all too expensive. You know, it costs what it costs. This is a luxury. This is not a basic necessity any of us need. But at the same time. You know, you have to be realistic about what you can expect consumers to do. Yeah, it could ultimately hurt their, um, right there, as you guys have been sort of pointing to it, it could really hurt their product line in the sense of, right, as you pointed out, Chris, a lot of their products, there's these sort of tournaments, there's these big events. If I can't pick them up on discount, right, then that means you're not getting the full volume of potential competitors into these events, uh, and since a huge portion of the fun of a tournament is having the thousands narrow down to the last two, right, under the grand finale, if anything that limits the number of people who might be picking up your game is going to be potentially disastrous to the health of your tournament economy, or I don't know if economy is the right word there, but the environment of your tournaments. Yeah, I think from a marketing standpoint, it makes a lot of sense for the company if they raise the prices and or have discounts in such a way that it defines who their customers are. So your, you know, flight system people, they'll be those people because you won't have, as, you know, as Moday said, you won't have people just buying a ton of different games. And the thing is, gamers, the type of gamers that we are, tabletop gamers, we like to try a little bit of everything and then find things that we might really like and then, then kind of wade into the waters and kind of jump in. But if the price points don't allow us to try a lot of different things, then we have to specialize, which I'm, I'm sure for their marketing department is exactly what they want. So we're going to be kind of limited. We're going to have to maybe at some point be a little more choosy. You know, I'm just going to play this because it's a financial investment to this point, whereas I could try a couple of different things and maybe find something I like. So maybe the new gamer doesn't really land somewhere because they didn't have the diversity of opportunity to try all these different things. So maybe they lose out somewhere, grabbing a casual gamer into a hardcore gamer, but maybe it's easier just to deal with the hardcore gamers, but we will see. And speaking of friendly local game stores, probably many of you have seen online or at Board Game Geek that there is an kind of a growing legal situation right now with Myriad Games. Now, if you've listened to this podcast for some time, especially way back since the beginning, you may know that we all originally kind of met together and started the podcast off kind of supporting our friendly local game store, which was Myriad Games in Staten Island, New York. That was uh, kind of put together by three people, Dan Yarrington from Game Salute and Zev Schlesinger, famously from Z-Man Games and now currently with WizKids, and Paul Girardi, who was the store manager and also uh, part of this whole kind of arrangement. Now, we don't know any of the details. We were just gamers in the stores, and we weren't privy to any conversations or legal information. But it was a store that we were pretty proud to be a member of and a gamer there, and we supported the store, purchased products. And as I said, we started the podcast to kind of help spread or evangelize gaming, and especially at the Staten Island location there. So you can go online to Board Game Geek and read up on this kind of crazy legal information that's going on there and it might give you some insight about you know friendly local game stores and what they go through as far as putting product in the store and getting customers there and all the kind of political jockeying that goes on so it's a pretty tense situation and we'll be following it as it kind of grows and uh, hopefully this doesn't become too muddy, but uh, at least at this point, it seems to be kind of pretty stressful for the people that are involved. Yeah, it was a shame. It was um, this actually Mary was the first place I ever played a hobby board game. I think my son was not even quite a year old and it was just a 
a chance to get out of the house and do something. I was finally getting out and doing things and meeting new people. And it was a great place to hang out for a little over a year. So it was a shame when they shut down. And, you know, like Chris said, we didn't really know exactly what happened behind the scenes. We just know that it closed down very suddenly. We got the email about it shutting down the weekend before they had a sale, you know, kind of clearing out some of the stock at a, a bit of a discount, pretty significant discount for a, a FLGS. So um, it was all a lot of things were unclear at the time. I remember when it happened and everybody was very upset because it was not something we saw coming. So this happening, you know, a couple years down the road, again, kind of surprising, but also not that surprising just because things kind of seem to end a little unclearly. So it's Again, we don't really know what happened, but it's something we'll keep an eye on because we are a little bit closer to it than, you know, a lot of people are just because we we hung out there. We lived there. We, you know, we know a lot of the people involved. So from the friendly local game store to some of our online platforms that we've been talking about. And before we get into all of that greatness with new podcasts, new YouTube videos, I think we need to thank the man who's been doing all of this. Uh, Daniel, thank you again for volunteering, Anthony, to put up some more videos and some more podcasts uh we can't thank you enough do you want to just i know you're, you're a very humble man and you don't like to take credit for these things but why don't you just take a second well, and just... you know I, I always try to be uh as motivated as possible and as proactive as possible while committing anthony's time uh to the nice. project that we're we're engaged in here uh it, it's very, very important good. for me that i i work anthony as hard as possible for the betterment Thank of you. the of the uh, podcast, uh, but seriously, I... Anthony has been doing an enormous amount of work. Uh... But and yet, and but yet, we thank you. <laughs> so, and, and on behalf of all the listeners, we thank you. So, way to go, my friend. Way to go. Oh man, I missed Daniel being on the on the show to take credit for things I've been doing. <laughs> it's been so long. If only I could get this deal like at. In real life, you know, yeah, right? <laughs> at a job where I just get credit for things that other people do constantly. You just got to get into middle management, man. That's that's what it's all about. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. So, what, Anthony, what have you been doing these days? All right. So, um, so uh, as Daniel uh, volunteered me for, uh, for a long time I was doing a bit of a solo segment on the show, and I had fun with it, and it just... When we went monthly, it didn't really quite fit the format as well. So I decided to start my own little spinoff podcast, which is just me, um, talking like 20, 25 minutes. For now, it's every week, but we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, and it's the different games I've been playing solo. Uh, it's called Table for One. So as of this coming out, we should be up to episode three or four on that. So you could check that out. It's linked up on the website. It's on a separate feed. I'm going to drop a couple episodes into this feed, too, just so those people who maybe haven't seen it or don't go to the website in general can find it. But if you're listening to this and it's not in the feed yet, go check it out. It's it's on iTunes. It's on the website. It is all about solo gaming, but also about things like how to learn new games you know, by playing through them, how to play games with your kids when they're not really playing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff to solo gaming that's just not necessarily just sitting and playing by yourself. Uh, there's a lot of things I do that, you know, we brought home 30 plus games from Gen Con. I had to learn all those mostly by myself. So <laughs> that was a lot of talking about that kind of stuff too. You know, all the different things I do that aren't at the game store or with, uh, you know, my gaming groups. The other thing that I've been working on, and this is more of a pilot at the moment, but, uh, we, you know, we've been talking for a while about getting some YouTube videos up. So, uh, as kind of the first run at that, I put together a short review for Terraforming Mars. Um, which at the moment is probably my favorite game of the year thus far. So spoiler, if you haven't watched the review yet, game is really good. To that end, you know, that review turned out really good. I've gotten some great feedback. I'm definitely going to be doing some more. I had just been waiting for a device with more storage because I did that first review using my two or three year old phone, which did not have enough storage to actually record for more than 20 minutes. So, you know, a little behind the scenes peek at how we get things done around here. <laughs> recording with my with my cell phone so definitely gonna be doing more of those i have a couple games lined up i promise to walk through for that game probably do some solo playthroughs don't expect that content quite as often as you know maybe the solo podcast but uh it i enjoy it it's something i know a lot of people appreciate and when we did our survey back in august the number one thing people asked for was more youtube content specifically short reviews like five to ten minutes so that's what i'm going to work on uh, lots of good games that have been playing lately. Definitely want to get some stuff up for that. 
And then the last thing is uh, been writing a lot more reviews for the website as well. So if you prefer to read your reviews over watching or listening, uh, there are, I'm trying to get two or three up per week uh, on the website, boardgamersanonymous.com. So you can go over there, you can check out, uh, I've written reviews for a lot of games I've been playing lately, um, In the Name of Odin, Potion Explosion, uh, just did Xenoshift, Dreadmire um, was the new version of Xenoshift that just came through. Um, currently working on write-ups for um, one game I'll be talking about today, Francis Drake, as well as um, a handful of other games that uh, have kind of crossed the table in recent weeks. So check those out as well, and there'll be new ones up every week for that too. So yeah, lots of stuff. I guess I've had extra time. I don't know. <laughs> well, with the kids off at school. So keep an eye on that, and uh, hopefully you know we'll have a lot more stuff up here in the not-too-distant future. Well, that sounds great. Thank you again, Daniel. We appreciate it. Anthony, is there anything new? Maybe a newsletter contest, possibly, maybe? I don't know. Daniel, did you volunteer for something like that? You know, I might have. I might have. It was a long list he sent over. So, I mean, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't blame him if he forgot what was on the list. Uh, it's true. Yeah, so the newsletter, which we've had for a while, and if you've entered any of our contests, you are on the newsletter, um, unless you've unless you've asked not to be in which case you know you might want to sign up again because every month we'll have a contest for anybody on that newsletter can have a chance to win a ten dollar gift card from us just for being on it so and what that is is every week i'll send you links to all of the content that's coming out so um, recent reviews videos and or podcast episodes so if you miss something uh we i will shoot you a message on tuesday or wednesday depending on what time it goes out um, that kind of runs through, you know, all the new content for the week. And then the last Tuesday of the month, which means you probably just missed it, but you can get in for October. You can, we'll have the drawing and you can, um, have a chance to win that $10. So it's really easy to sign up, go to the website. Uh, after a few seconds, a pop-up will appear. You just throw your uh, first name and email address in there and you are on the list. And I will, I promise I will only send that one email once a week. So I will not spam you. Uh, too much, unless Daniel asked me to, in which case, you know, he's the boss. Yep. Daniel? We'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll keep the policy as it is for now, but you never know what right. I'll feel inclined to volunteer Anthony for in the future. Nice. All right, guys. All right. Well, that all sounds good. Now let's get on to some games. And now our acquisition disorders. Acquisition disorders? That's crazy! Only needs the base game, nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion. See? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game, the expansion, and the promos, and of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion... Alright, so we're talking about our acquisition disorders this week. You know those games that you hear about, or you see them online, or you just see them at the table, and you just want to jump in? You want to grab them, you want to pick them up, you want to throw them back in your bag? You just want to get your hands on these games. So... Let's talk about what's brand new and what should be hitting your table. So, Daniel, what do you have up for us? Well, I have to admit mine's probably not uh, all that exciting right now, partially because I've been running back and forth a lot. I've not been keeping up with the sort of the new the new hotness, right, the the best games out there. Uh, today I was actually at a bargain store nearby my uh, new home and happened to find a copy of Machi Koro, which is nice. It's a game I've wanted to pick up for a while. It's It's a fun game. And so it was, you know, $10, so that was great. But otherwise, the only real thing that's sort of on the near horizon for me, uh, and otherwise, the only thing that's on the near horizon for me is that tiny Epic Western is on is uh, finally shipping. Uh, they sent out, you know, some of the various sort of side gifts a while ago, right? So they sent out the tiny Epic uh, Galaxies copy I'd ordered earlier on. Um, but... Western has taken a little bit longer to produce, and, you know, they're getting everything in order. But they have confirmed my address. I have gotten my shipping information. It is coming. So soon I will finally have all the games I have backed on Kickstarter in my apartment, and that will be great. Uh, and I look forward to breaking out Tiny Epic Western because, in general, I'm a big fan of the Tiny Epic game series. And why is that? Well, I don't know. I think it's because they're epic, and also I'm a you know possibly tiny. That that that's okay. I think that that might be it. Makes sense. I mean, epic and tiny. Did you Great see the new um, Kickstarter for the Tiny Epic Galaxies expansion? Yeah, I. I... <laughs> I've I've been fighting the urge because they just keep sending me these emails of all the the new exciting projects they're working on, and one of the things about making games that are this small, I guess, is that you can just churn through them at absurd speeds. 
So there's a lot of really interesting stuff coming out from these guys. Uh, and I, I am having to, to restrain myself actively there. So we'll have to see. I'll, I'll, I'll give it uh, more time now that I'm actually, well, in a single state for a couple of days. Maybe I'll, I'll poke my head through and see if there's anything exciting showing up. At what point does it no longer be tiny? Yeah, that actually I, I, is something that counts against me getting expansions for a lot of these games. If they're complete already, right, if they feel good, so, you know, Tiny Epic Kingdoms has what a whole other box you can get, makes it considerably less tiny, and that takes away one of the big advantages of these games for me, right? If you put too many boxes together, now you're starting to compete with full-sized, full-weight games, and that's not mm -hmm. a real good comparison for them. So I, I prefer to keep my tiny tiny. Uh, so it is possible I will just choose not to pick up these expansion packs. Yeah, I feel the same way too. I think at some point it's just a branding situation and not really a game mechanic kind of situation. And it just kind of loses a lot of the luster because of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anthony, what do you have for us this week? All right. So the first game I wanted to talk about is one that I very actively poo-pooed at Gen Con. I said, no way. Why is this the big release from Fantasy Flight? What a waste. That would be Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. <laughs> I almost feel like I have to eat crow a little bit on this. It is not a game I had any interest in. I'm not generally a big Ameritrash guy. And I couldn't actually imagine how implementation of the app would make it that much better. Fast forward a month and a half, and I was at a friend's house last weekend for a game day. And he pulled out Mansions of Madness, and I had not played it, so I was... I'm always up for, you know, one playthrough of anything. He set it up, and we played the fourth scenario, the last one. It's the longest one, and it was a bit of a kind of a murder mystery with a big combat set piece at the end. I'm not going to run through how the game plays overall. This isn't really a review. I just played it the one time. But basically what it is is super, super Ameritrashy. You know, you're moving around the map. You're searching different things. You're gathering items. You're getting all these cards and items and abilities and building up all these tokens for extra rolls and you're rolling dice on everything to see if you succeed and all of that sounds kind of boring um you know on face level but the really cool part of the game is that it uses this app now if i just said hey it's a game that uses an app and it does this stuff it doesn't sound very interesting which is kind of what i read at gen con and that's why i had no interest in the game but the app itself is extremely good for three reasons first it randomizes setup every single time you play. So not only is the map different, but the items you get are different. We actually had it crash, uh, Steam crashed, not the app, but Steam crashed the first time. So we'd already set out all our, you know, setup stuff for the items. And then we had to reset it. And it was completely different when we reset it the second time. So that's pretty cool. You know that everything's highly replayable. Second, it keeps track of everything. So there's no bookkeeping at all. You don't have to worry about what you need to roll to succeed. You don't have to worry about which enemies have how much health. You don't have to worry about who's standing where or what you've already killed or what's going to come out next. All that stuff you would normally do that would make this four-hour experience an eight-hour experience is gone. Very cool. The third thing is that it's a very immersive experience. So there's music playing in the background the whole time, and we had it set up on a computer monitor plugged into a Mac, so it's kind of this cool like monitor in the corner that we could see at all times. Uh, the map adjusts and uploads and kind of adds new stuff every time you bring out a new tile. Uh, and then you can inter interface with it and remove things from the map. And then there are puzzles as you move through it that you have to solve in the game. And based on your whatever statistic it requires for you to solve that puzzle is how many actions you have to solve it. So maybe it requires intelligence uh, and you only have a three in intelligence. So you get three moves and you don't solve it in three moves, so that puzzle now goes to the second round. All the while, you're getting beat up by these monsters. You have to solve the puzzle as quickly as possible, so the more intelligent person wants to run up and get more moves on it. The other people at the table are not allowed to help unless they're standing next to you while doing the puzzles. It's really cool. I honestly didn't think I would like this at all, but I ended up being the game I had the most fun with that day. So this is now on my acquisition disorder list, and it, there's nothing else like this in my collection. I have a lot of games so <laughs> i was i was very surprised um mansions and madness second edition that the fact that it's that much better than the original has that much more going on for it 
it makes me, I think, more excited for what else they're going to do with similar style of apps because there are so many games from Fantasy Flight or just themes in general that I like so much more that if you add this thing I like already to those, I'm going to be very excited. That must have been some crazy setup between having the Steam up, have obviously having a computer going, having the table space or the table near the computer. Is is that a viable situation or is that just going to be a one and done, maybe once a year kind of, you know, get everyone to the table for that kind of situation? I don't know. I mean, it sounds really tough. And to be fair, we were at someone's house, so he had everything already set up. Like, this is the way he wanted to run the game. You can run the app on an iPad and just pass it around the table. It doesn't have to be this big, epic presentation. That's just the coolest way to do it. What offsets all that, I think, is first off, it doesn't actually take up a ton of table space. Most of the maps aren't that big. But second, the setup of the game is really, really fast. Because the only thing you really have to do to start is pick your characters And then the game tells you everything else that needs to come out and you just pull it out as it comes out. So I think we set up the game in like 10 minutes versus, you know, they were telling me the first edition would take an hour to set up. And then if you screwed it up, you were in trouble. So all that said, I don't think I would ever take this to like the coffee shop where we normally play because the the footprint is big. The amount of time it takes can vary. And it was pretty long, the game we played. Um, But for like a game day at someone's house, sitting around, beer and pretzels type of game I, I think it's really fun so yeah i think you're right but at the same time i think it, it could come out fairly frequently if you have the right group for it what else do you have for us this week all right so the second one is not one i've played yet but i'm equally interested in it mostly just because of the pedigree of the designer that is the great western trail so this is designed by alexander feister and he has designed the last two kennerspiel winners broom service and isle of sky and mombasa which very well could be the next kennerspiel winner because <laughs> that's a brilliant game. So those are his three games, three of the best, you know, midweight euros that have mid to heavyweight euros that have come out in the last year, two years. And his next one is about a rancher moving cattle between Texas and Kansas City in the 19th century. So thematically, it's not something you see very often, and it's kind of this Wild West theme. And it's not even really Wild West. It's really about the economics of being a rancher and cowboys in that time era. The game is. So it's it's really about getting the most valuable cattle herd between the two cities, which you'll do multiple times throughout the game. But there's a lot of other stuff mixed in. So you also have to hire good staff, which includes like cowboys and craftsmen and engineers. Um, you have to visit certain buildings along the way, kind of build up your tableau of different things. The rule book, I think, just went up not too long ago. So it kind of gave that a skim and the board, you know, all the different photos of the board and everything, which looks pretty busy. You know, if you've played Mombasa, you, you know, imagine something like that, but you know, in uh, 19th century United States, Texas. It's not as heavily map based, but that kind of level of, you know, intricacy on the board. But all of that combined with the pedigree of the designer and the intricacy of what I've read in the rules so far, I think this is going to be a really good game. It's I'm pretty sure it's coming out at uh, Essen, but in the US for us, it is a stronghold release and it should be out by the end of the year. So almost certainly one i'm going to be picking up at some point yeah that's a great pedigree and i definitely look forward to picking that one up as well all right so two games that recently popped up on my acquisition disorder first up small world river world now if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time you know i'm a big small world fan i am a completionist so i have to pick up all the different sets now small world river world is not much different than their previous expansions But this one has a little bit of everything. So basically what you're looking at is some new board setups. And in particular, because it's River World, the main kind of feature of these boards are these kind of extensive rivers. So what you're looking at as far as interactions and mechanics here is you're looking at the addition of pirates. Now this is really what plays the biggest role in the game because at the startup of the game, just like you have the in-decline races, you also have pirates set up on river spaces. So if you do capture a region next to a pirate, it's going to reduce the coin that you get at the end of the round. So you really do have to kind of jump in there in the water, and the pirates act as just one race token of any race. And so you conquer that region, you take out that pirate, The round comes to an end, and because it's a river space, and if you don't have a race that has a special ability to 
be able to conquer that region, then you have to take them back and go back in there later on. So it's a little different as, you know, throwing that little mechanic in. There is also a little event pile that happens, and each round you'll flip over one of these kind of tokens, and an event occurs. So it could be a storm, it could be quiet waters, a harsh winter, or more pirates. And basically, what we're talking about here is more effects to the rivers at that turn. So, in fact, if it becomes a harsh winter, then you can actually conquer the regions because the water becomes firm. Or if it's a storm, now that area takes a lot more tokens to kind of conquer that area so you can move through. There's also harbors in this game in which you'll be able to conquer those regions, score additional victory points, and then be able to branch out to new regions that normally wasn't accessible. So in all, this is a nice little expansion from Days of Wonder that I probably will pick it up. It's not essential. It doesn't come with any new races or any new special abilities, just some different map interactions. The quality looks good. There's not a lot of information out there yet, but I'll be picking that up pretty soon. My second acquisition disorder is a game that I've looked at for quite some time, and Anthony and I have actually done a review, and that's Epic PvP. So you heard us talk about this because we got a chance to play this at Origins. Now they have a recent Kickstarter that will actually be wrapping up on Friday, October 14th. And this version is actually just more races, but in this case, it's magic. So you're going to get the Satyr, a Shard, Pixie, a Djinn, a Seer, an Artificer, a Pyromancer, a Shaman, and a Troll race. Not to mention the Necromancer that only comes in this version. So instead of just the usual Fighter or Samurai, you're actually going to get some magical races with some magical abilities or magical classes that come along with this set. Now, this Kickstarter will allow you to pick up pretty much everything that's come up previously if you want to go that far with it. But PvP was something that I had liked at Origins and, and kind of thought about picking up, but it didn't do anything special or different that we haven't seen in other, you know, one versus one games. But with this magic kind of race and class kind of picking up, you know, a, a different flavor that we haven't seen previously, I'm actually kind of engaged in this and I actually might pick this up on Kickstarter. So those are my acquisition disorders, and that's our acquisition disorders. So if it piqued any of your acquisition disorders, maybe you want to pick those games up. And now, at the table with BGA. Okay, so we're going to talk about our at the table this week. We're going to let you know what games have been hitting our table, but just not what's hitting our table, but what's worthy of hitting your table. And we'll let you know if that game is worth the buy, and you should also run out and pick up that game. Or if it's just a play, if you see it running at a table, jump in. Or possibly maybe the game is a dodge. It's, it's an okay game, but maybe not really worth your time. Or if the game is a dreaded burn, and it's just kind of a game experience, it's really not worth your time at all, and you should avoid that game at all costs. So, Daniel, why don't you start us off this week? All right, well, first, the the first game I want to talk about this week is Pandemic the Cure. I picked this game up at the last Barnes & Noble Red Dot sale and didn't really get a chance to get it out until somewhat recently. Uh, and I got to play it with my mother and my wife, which is always fun to play pandemic-themed games with them because they're both in public health. Um, so this is, is a very real concern to them, uh, and it, it's, you know, fun to sit there and my mom will just start telling stories of, oh, this disease is moving like tuberculosis did in the in the middle ages or just oh well that's depressing but pandemic the cure is basically a slimmed down version of pandemic it keeps the cooperative elements and the individual roles it keeps i think a fair amount of the difficulty and the variable difficulty uh but the actual gameplay itself is much simpler uh, instead of having individual countries you have the regions of the world each of which are considered as wholes rather than individual subunits, right? So in the original pandemic, you have those little the little cities scattered throughout. Uh, and this one, it's something like a clock face with, I think, six regions on it. The same sort of rules for overflow happen. If you get more than three blocks of a certain infection in any region, it spreads to the next region. Uh, there's an order to the regions, which means that it spreads in a predictable way which has an interesting effect of seeing these sort of nightmare situations where you're going, oh no, 
Because if that spreads, then that overflows, then that overflows, and you get to a point where like the cycle completes itself, and you have perpetuating disease outbreak. Uh, I really enjoyed playing Pandemic the Cure. Uh, it's a simple cooperative game with variable roles and variable powers, like Pandemic is, but it's a little bit more setup light and rules light, which made it easier for my mom and my wife, both of whom are sort of uh, are not really gamers, to get involved and jump in with me. I've always found it interesting that Pandemic is sort of the default introductory cooperative game for a lot of people, because it's actually a little bit fiddly at places. There's a fair amount of bookkeeping with the way the cards flip up and that sort of thing. Uh, and I think Pandemic the Cure cuts that out and really just gets the essence of Pandemic. That does mean it's a simpler game, so if you really enjoy the complexity that you can get out of a full-fledged game of Pandemic, then this is not the move for you. Uh, but if what you want is the feel of Pandemic in a very tight, uh, very uh, thin package, uh, then this is a great, a great game to pick up. So I, I recommend buying Pandemic the Cure if you like cooperative games and you like things on the lighter end. Uh, and I definitely re recommend playing it for pretty much everybody. How is the difficulty compared to regular Pandemic? Because I had a buddy who said that if the more players you have, and I know you only play with three, but he said the more players you had, the harder it was. Do you get a sense that it was easier or harder than the base? Yeah, I think as you increase number, it's going to get... And this is true with a lot of cooperative games where they have that mechanic of each turn, every action, something happens, right? Because it's that much longer before the character who's able to resolve the problem is able to go. And I think this game would have a very steep punishment for playing with additional players, which is, I think, fun. I actually think this game can be uh, very punishing. I, at first, I thought it, would, it looked kind of simple. And so I was like, oh, well, this is going to be easy. Uh, but if you want this game to be hard, if you're willing to set it up a few notches, or if you're going to play with a large group, it can really punish you. Cool. That's, this is one that I was looking for during that sale, and none of my local stores had it, but I'm still eager to give it a go. So the other game I've been playing recently, as our listeners know, I play a lot of role-playing games with a group of friends of mine from college, uh, and we're still continuing our pattern of playing Apocalypse World hacks. Uh, and the variant of Apocalypse World we're playing now is called Worlds in Peril. And it is a superhero-themed uh, Apocalypse World hack. It has one of the lar longest rule books of any Apocalypse World variant I've seen. Part of this is because it's actually a little bit more complex than most Apocalypse World games. But most of it's actually because they appear to have hired a full-on cartoonist to do uh, exposition of the game rules and all these sort of example events as a comic book, essentially. Um, and that really puts you in the spirit right away. Uh, Worlds in Peril has some really interesting things. So they handle your relationships a lot better than Apocalypse World in general does. Uh, the way they handle it in this case is that uh, it, you can have these sorts of relationships with various groups of people called bonds. This is a familiar system to anyone in Apocalypse World. But one thing you can do is that you can burn a bond to achieve some goal or to, to move your... Uh, a failure to a moderate success or a moderate success to a complete success. And the nice thing about that is that it it makes a little bit more narrative sense than the way bonds typically work. It is still pretty gamey. Um, I have given myself my, my personal rule of I do not burn a bond unless I can make a narrative justification for it. So a good example of that would be something like I could burn a bond with the police if I allowed police officers to come to harm to, for the sake of capturing a villain, right? That would be a good justification. Or you could burn a bond with the city, and so the police and the city are the two that everybody has to have. Uh, because in my last attempt to save the day, I took out several large buildings, and, you know, people died, and it was a tragedy. Even though the day was saved, the city's not so happy about you anymore. Um it is a little weird in that if you're willing to make it very gamey, if you want it to be gamey, it can be super gamey. So you can do things where, like, I'm going to burn a bond with somebody who's not even on planet right now, and I'll figure out what it is I did to piss them off later. Um, I'm not a big fan of that element, so I've, I've restricted myself. Uh, it also has a little bit more complicated way of handling the way you acquire moves and advance. Um, one thing that is nice is all of your advancements are narrative. 
Uh, so you pick an origin book, which tells you where you came from. So, you know, you're an alien or you were created in a lab accident or whatever. Uh, and it gives you uh, certain basic capacities. Uh, then on top of that, and so you get access to all of those abilities right off the bat. Uh, you get a drive book, which gives you it's sort of what your character is going to do. Uh, and you can unlock multiple of these and you unlock them through narrative moments. So if your character is taking the uh, You're Out Who I Am book, then you unlock that book the first time your character has a character crisis in, in game. Uh, and then you immediately get the effects of the first move. And then each further move has further narrative requirements. Uh, I like that because it's very narratively driven and I'm a sucker for narrative driven advancement. Um, and it fits the sort of comic book pacing of people tend to get powers and have realizations when the the world narrative best demands it, right? So when it would be dramatic. And so it does make that pacing very nice. But it does mean that if what you like about Apocalypse World is that it is rules light and very simple, this one's a little bit more complex than most. It's also super flexible uh, in that you just describe what your character can do as a simple, difficult, borderline, possible and impossible actions. Uh, and that gives the picture of your character's strength. So you could just as easily create uh, Superman as you could Daredevil. And there's nothing limiting you from doing that, uh, which has benefits and penalties. One thing is you have to be really sure that everyone's on the same page or else you're going to have Superman running next to Daredevil and that's not a very interesting game. But on the other hand, it means that you are free to make whatever kind of power level you want with the same rule system. So that's probably one of the greatest strengths of Worlds in Peril is that it's got this enormous flexibility with the characters you create. And since you just make up their powers, they can do anything, right? They could be a, a technomancer. They could be a... Uh, I don't know, a pyromancer, they could be a telekinetic, they can be a brawler, they can be a technician, right? Uh, and you can just keep making up whatever sort of power sets you want. Uh, overall, playing it has been, I mean, something of a familiar experience if you've played Apocalypse World, but I do like that it has a lot of sort of character teamwork interaction in it. It is prone right now, at least we're having troubles getting away from a sort of freak of the week feel where, all right, here's the villain, beat him. Okay, you beat him, go home. But part of that's because of the way we designed our characters, and that seems like it's coming to an end as relationships develop and conflicts emerge. Uh, overall, I think that Worlds in Peril is a very strong role-playing game. If you like the Apocalypse World systems and you like superhero themes, I think it's a buy, at least a play, but probably a buy. And even if you're not particularly fond of either one of those, I would suggest giving it a shot for a session or two, uh, just because it's good to see what you like and what you don't. Uh, and I think most people will find Worlds in Peril to be a solid addition to their role-playing game shelf. So those are my at-the-tables. Yeah, so those are my at-the-tables for, honestly, these last couple of months. Uh, how about you, Chris? What okay. have you been up to while I've been away? Well, you know, if you're going to volunteer me for it, I'll go next. Okay. Well, I got to play three games, <laughs> which actually, in fact, I never thought I would play. Um, because they tend not to be the games that I'm really hardcore into, but nonetheless, you play, you play what the, what the table wants to play. So I'm going to talk about three lighter games this week. So the first game up is actually from a game that I really do love quite a bit and actually find it to be one of the best games of all time. And that's Love Letter. Now, I'm not going to talk about the original Love Letter, and I'm not going to talk about the brand new fancy Love Letter, which we talked about last episode. I am going to talk about the Munchkin version of Love Letter, which is called Loot Letter. Now, once again, if you've ever listened to our episodes previously, you know that I'm actually a big fan of Munchkin. Wait, wait, don't, don't shut the podcast off yet. Munchkin does have a lot of redeeming value to it, especially the artwork by John Kovalik, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting at Gen Con. So when I heard that there was going to be a Munchkin version of Love Letter, I, you know, saying, well, being the completionist that I am, I have to pick it up, even though I own, I guess at this point, three other versions of Love Letter. So when I got this into my hand and I was playing this with my family, I got to tell you, I could not be more disappointed with this version. Uh, you know, right from the start, the card quality is complete junk. The... 
illustrations that they chose for the eight cards in this game make almost no sense with the exception of the wishing ring which is number four and if you know anything about munchkin the wishing ring gets gets rid of all curses from you so it makes sense that that would be the hand mating which basically protects you from any attack but beyond that the potted plant as the guard it makes no sense the mole rat the duck of doom which is a hardcore munchkin kind of card but nonetheless it doesn't make sense here the netrol the dreaded gazebo the Turbonian Dragon and the Loot card? I mean, come on. Honestly, I don't know what Steve Jackson was thinking about or any of his people were thinking about when putting this together because there are so many fantastic illustrations, so many class cards, so many race cards, so many curse cards, and yet they put together illustrations that really don't go along with the love letter you know, characters in the game. So, I gotta tell you, could not be more disappointed. Really want to throw this game out. Um, seriously thinking of getting rid of it. Just tossing in the garbage because I honestly could not be more unhappy with this. I mean, Love Letter is a great game. The brand new Super Premium uh, Deluxe Edition is amazing. And there is also the Lord of the Rings version. There's also the Batman version. There's also the original, you know, uh, Japanese version. All great versions. This one's junk. This is a burn. I am burning a Munchkin game. So I know that's not crazy for a lot of people out there, but this version is not worth your time because of the components, because of the chosen artwork, and because there are many, many, many more versions out there that are a lot better than this. <laughs> so turning to another game that's been out there for quite some time and we've all played, We've all played Werewolf. Um, for me, that's quite unfortunate. Probably for many of you, you kind of either stomach it or enjoy Werewolf. I find that Werewolf is kind of a waste of time. And even sometimes to admit this, I'll actually try to get killed off in Werewolf. But nonetheless, you know, I go along with it and I kind of am okay with it at least most of the time. But friends of mine were at the table and they said, you want to sit down and play Salem? And I'm like, Salem, what's that? And they said, well, it's like Werewolf. And I was like, oh, no, I don't really want to play that. And they're like, no, it's a little different. You should definitely play. So I sat down and I played Salem. And I'll tell you, it is somewhat different than Werewolf. <laughs> so basically in Salem, you're talking about the Salem Witch Trials. And in this game, instead of Werewolves, you are could be possibly a witch. So at the start of the game, you get these five roll cards, and one of the roll cards could say that you're the witch. And just like in Werewolf, you're going to be doing these kind of sinister deeds to knock out the villagers in the game. So that's your basically roll. But instead of just having this daytime phase and nighttime phase, what you're going to be doing is playing a lot of cards throughout this game. So you're going to have your roll cards in front of you that are going to say that if you're not a witch or if you're a witch. If you have the witch card, you are a witch. You also have one of your townspeople role that's going to give you a special ability, and that's pretty interesting. The artwork looks really nice. It kind of has that kind of classic colonial gothic look to it. And on your turn, you're going to either draw two cards or you're going to play as many cards as you want. And most of the time, those cards are going to be acquisition cards, and you can play these acquisition cards against other players. And if you accuse them seven times, they have to flip over one of their cards and... Those roll cards are life cards. So if you get the other person to flip over all of their cards, they're out for the game. Now, basically, as a town person, you want to find the witch card. So if you're able to eliminate the number of witch cards that are in the game, and that's based upon the number of players, you win the game or the townspeople win the game. And that's great. But as the game goes on, there's going to be night phases. And during the night phase, of course, the witches will wake up and be able to knock out a townsperson by putting a black marker there. Now, there's there's also a constable that'll be able to save someone, not knowing who's going to be knocked out. But as the game goes on, that witch card or the witch cards are going to move around the game, kind of cursing the other players, the other townspeople. So as the game goes on, you're going to have more witches, even though you might have only one or two witch cards. So if you've gotten one of those witch cards, now you are cursed and you become a witch and you take part of the witching phase. Nonetheless, as the town people, you just need to knock out those witch cards. 
And there's a lot of different types of cards that kind of really mess with people. You'll be able to play certain cards to save people or certain cards that tie certain people together. There's a lot of different effects, just like every other kind of werewolf game. Now, I'm kind of on the fence with this. I, I could say this game is worth the play. I could also say that, nonetheless, this game is still a dodge. But if you really do like werewolf, this game might be for you. If you don't like werewolf, like I don't like werewolf, I would say it's still kind of worth a play. So either way, I would recommend that this game is a play because it's one of those games that you're going to face one way or the other. And, you know, if you do like werewolf, play Salem. If you don't like werewolf, maybe you want to kind of, you know, point the group that way because at least it has some game to it. So overall, I'm going to recommend the game as a play. Wow, this has been a a night and day sort of reversal for you today. This has been a very <laughs> weird, very weird day for you, Chris. Yes, I I, I think I blame Anthony's uh, Mansions of Madness a little of insanity is going on. <laughs> I don't like the Munchkin game, and yet I kind of like the Werewolf game. So, yeah, I'm not well here. So, I don't yeah, know. This whole episode's upside um, down. I don't know what's going on. Guys. <laughs> uh, what is Daniel doing? I don't know. All right, so the last game that I'm... It's actually going to continue with this level of insanity is Cool Mini or Not Unusual Suspects. This game has kind of largely been characterized in the board gaming community as being a uh, choose your racism type of game or choose your stereotype type of game. Because what you're going to be doing in this game is you're going to try to figure out who is the culprit in, out of this lineup. So at the start of the game, one player is going to be giving clues about who is actually the suspect, the the real person you want to kind of nail. Who is that thief? So you're going to start out with 12 possible suspects, and then someone's going to be asking questions. And then the person who's giving the clues will either confirm that that person is in fact, let's say, for example, the type of person who, you know, would go to a dance club. Or that's the type of person that wouldn't go to a dance club. So if they say, would this person go to a dance club? Then that person either plays a check mark or an X mark. And then everybody else at the table has to figure out which of those suspects would actually follow that, you know, that clue. So if the person says, yeah, that person would definitely go to a dance club, then which ones wouldn't? And once again, it goes back to these stereotypes and biases that maybe the older woman would not go to a dance club. But maybe they would. But nonetheless, you have to play the player and not really play the game so much. So what would the player say in that situation? Now, i got to say, I thought I was going to hate this game. I thought it was going to be terrible. I thought it was going to be biased and racist and stereotypes. And it kind of is a little bit. But nonetheless... I don't think that the cards or the questions here are so, you know, divisive that you're really going to feel uncomfortable with it. And once again, it's they're not really tied to any nationality. At least the number of games I played, I didn't come across any cards that I thought was particularly deplorable or particularly racially incentive, depending on what, you know, the clue giver kind of gave the clue. The game's worth the play. I can't believe that I'm saying for a party game that's basically almost a little random and, you know, a little silly. It's kind of worth your time if you're going to play a party game. So, yeah, this has been a very weird at the table this last episode. And, uh, yeah, if you see this game at the table, I would say play it once just to get the feel for it. You probably never need to play it again, but it's worth the play. Who are you? I don't know. <laughs> really Where are the Euros, <laughs> man? Oh man, it's been a bad, it's been a bad time, man. It's been bad. <laughs> all right, well, hopefully, Anthony, you can save us. What games do you have for us at the table this week? All right, uh, all right. So these are more in line with what I typically play. So at least I'm not out there playing party games and werewolf clones. I don't know what you're doing. Ranking on a Munchkin game, I, I'm surprised by that. <laughs> uh, so the first one is this is one I picked up at uh, at Gen Con this year. Uh, from uh, Ape Games, and it actually had a copy last year that they sent me as it was. I guess it was a prototype. So it was right before the Kickstarter uh, for the Great Dinosaur Rush. So this is another Scott Alms game. Um, he is making games every I don't know 
Friday, apparently. Uh, he has a new one out every couple months. And this is probably one of the bigger games he's released. It's a full-size board game. It's not tiny epic anything. It's not a small box. It's a good-sized game. Uh, and it is about the Great Paleontology Wars of the 19th century, which sounds like a made-up thing, but apparently it's a very true thing, where when the first paleontologists were finding all these dinosaur bones, especially in the eastern United States, they were being complete jerks to each other. They were lying, they were sabotaging, they were blowing up dig sites, stealing bones from each other, making up dinosaurs, just sticking bones together and saying, look, a new species. So this game is kind of about that. And if you if you go into it thinking, oh, it's about digging up dinosaurs, it kind of is, but mostly it's about messing with each other and kind of building the most ridiculous, outlandish, impressive dinosaur you can with the bones that you draw up. So the game plays out over three rounds, five turns in each round. The goal is to gather bones from the field during these rounds. Uh, then you're going to publicize and increase certain scoring tracks, get bonus cards, and then you have the option to use notorious actions, uh, which will allow you to steal bones, dynamite sites, or jump ahead of the opponents. Uh, if you take these actions, which are purely optional, because there are regular options uh, for actions that typically also help you, the notorious actions, you will draw a notoriety token from a bag. And those have a number on them between one and three. Interesting mechanic here. The person with the most notoriety at the end of the game, the highest amount, is going to lose that many points. Everybody else gains the number of points that they get from the notoriety. This sounds really bad, like it would be a huge swing in the game. Um, in reality, your scores are going to be, you know, up over 100, 150. So the 10 or 15 points that this swings isn't going to be that huge. And if you have that many more notoriety points than other people, then you probably benefited in several ways from doing that. So the the basic idea here is every turn, you're going to move across this board, pick up three between one and three dinosaur bones. Each of the bone types, and they're really just little wooden sticks, corresponds to you know limbs, head bones, neck bones, spine bones, and then there are wilds and uniques. And the different scoring tracks that you can change will give you points if you have the longest neck or the biggest limbs or the biggest head or the most unique bones. So you'll be gathering all these bones and then adjusting the scoring track for yourself while everybody else is also adjusting the scoring track. Um, you can also reduce a scoring track at any point if you want to, if you see an opponent kind of running away with a category. And then at, in, during each of the three rounds, after you've done this three times, you are going to build a dinosaur. So you'll have all those bones in front of you. You will build something. There are some basic requirements for how to do this. Every dinosaur needs to have a head, a neck, a spine, one rib. Apparently, only need one rib. And then limbs and a tail. As long as you have that, you can do whatever else you want. And you have to use every bone you have, which is sounds complicated, but it's pretty simple because you can put them wherever you want. Once you're done with that, everybody will lift their screens. You will exhibit them, count up. The, who wins each of those scoring categories, and then do the scoring. And that's pretty much it. That's the round. There are bonus cards that will give you additional points if you match certain characteristics in your dinosaur. So a certain number of ribs or limbs or whatever it ends up being. But overall, I mean, it runs really smoothly. Uh, you have just those three rounds. Once people get going, it goes pretty quick. The most time-consuming part is building the dinosaur. But the cool thing is everybody does that simultaneously, and it's a lot of fun. So you're, it's like playing with you know, little toys or something. You're just building this thing out of all these little sticks. Honestly, last year I wasn't as enamored with this game, but part of that was that the rules were still a work in progress. They weren't fully fleshed out yet. I was working with a prototype. So playing the final game with the final rules, which are mostly clear now, except for a couple things I had to kind of work through. The final version is really, really good. It's smooth, it's relatively quick, it is a lot of fun to build a dinosaur. I would say 45 minutes to an hour tops. It's it's a really fun game. I had a lot of fun with it. I was surprised because after my experience last year, I didn't think it would be that great, but it, it kind of uh, impressed me, kind of what the polishing that went it went through during the Kickstarter. So uh, if you see it out there, which I think it's hitting retail as we speak, you know, give it a go. It's definitely a strong play from me. It's surprising that we don't see more dinosaur games like this. I mean, dinosaurs are just so huge in the toy, the movie industry, and big with kids. I'm I'm really surprised, but I'm really glad to see that this game is doing a lot better now. Yeah, it's a it's a fun one. It's surprising. And I think 
for kids, this would be very doable. Like Jack was sitting with me sure. when I was learning it and he kept asking me how things worked. And then he was sitting in the corner building his own dinosaur following the rules mm -hmm. while I was going through the rest. And he had no problem with it. He's five years old. And it, no problem. So mm -hmm. I think he still likes Triassic Terror mo more with all the little dinosaurs running around the board. But uh, sure. this, this one was a good one. All right. So the next game, this is one that it's been out for a little while. It is ranked in the top 300 on Board Game Geek. Daniel, I think you have a copy of this. And that is Francis Drake. Uh, this is... A designed by Peter Hawes out of Australia. Um, so here, most of the place, I think it's distributed by Eagle Griffin. And the theme is you're all English, English privateers going through the Spanish main, looting, burning, destroying, fighting galleons, and taking treasure on the way. And you're kind of being supported by the English government to do this because back in those days, the uh, English and the Spanish were not good friends. <laughs> so the game takes place over three rounds. Those are each of voyages. And... What you're going to do is each round you're going to gather resources. You are going to uh, make sure that you can go as far as you want to go. And then you're going to go on a voyage and do as much stuff as you can with the resources you gathered. Uh, so there's basically two halves to the game. Um, the first half, the resource gathering, is very interesting all on its own. It could just as easily have been kind of a throwaway where you just kind of pull resources randomly out of a bag. But they made this a very unique, interesting part of the game. So... What you have is this road with, I think, 16 different locations on it. And everybody will be able to go down the road. You can only go in one direction. Uh, it's similar to Takedo in that once you've reached a point, you can only go further. Um, you can't go backwards. So if you jump ahead three spaces with your first move, you cannot get the resources that are behind that. But you might really need that resource that's, that's three spaces ahead. So you kind of have to balance it out. Um, you get 10 discs with which to do this, so there is a lot of options. You can probably hit almost everything you need to, but some of these spaces are really good. Uh, some of them will give you an extra ship to sail with. Some of them will give you extra trading goods. Some of them will give you secret information other people don't have. But for the majority of them, you're gathering crew, guns, and trade goods, as well as the supplies that are needed to actually sail. Um, once you've done all that, your ships are all piled up with stuff you're going to get an order you know whoever's going to go first and then you have this big board uh it's a map of the spanish main and everybody's going to take turns placing their tokens down and the tokens have numbers between one and four you'll put them face down and you you basically put those where you want to go now each of these locations can only have two ships go there so if three people put their tokens on one location only the people with the top two numbers are going to be able to go, one being the best number. So if you put your four down somewhere and then people, two other people put their tokens down, you're probably not going to get to take an action there, which means you wasted your token. Uh, so it's very strategic where you place things, when you place it. If you really, really, really need to make sure you go to a certain location, use your one or get that extra ship, the Golden Hind, which kind of goes before everything else. The other interesting part of this is if you do not have enough supplies, you can't sail very far. The board is broken up into four spaces. So if you only have one supply, you can only go to the first section of the board. To get to the fourth section, all the way on the left side, you need all four supplies, which is kind of hard to grab. Two or three is relatively easy, but getting all four is a little rough. So if you don't have enough, you're not getting over to that other side. On the flip side, if you do get four, you probably will get that other side all to yourself because nobody else is going to be able to get that far. Once that's all done, you'll flip them all over, see who gets to go, then you'll sail your ships. You send them out there, you will be fighting different levels of troops and dealing with galleons if you decide to fight the galleons, which requires that your ships are upgraded, and you'll be spending your resources as you go. So you'll keep going until you decide you're done, and then you sail back to England with all of your stuff, and you decide, um, you know, how much of that you're going to get. The first person to complete each of these locations gets a gem that's there. There's silver, gold, and then jewels. Those are going to go in this little treasure box that you get to build, which is pretty cool. Uh, and they're hidden for the whole game. And then you're also going to get victory points, which are printed on the board. The end of the game is basically after the third voyage, you count up who has the most uh, points. Then you count up all of the victory points that are hidden in your little treasure chest. Um, there's a few other ways that you can score points. If you're the governor, for example, you score for all the gold that is not taken off the board. There's a few secret 
things that you can do as well from some of the special powers on the board. But that's kind of the gist of the game is you have those two different sections. Uh, I was very, very impressed with it. It is the combination of hidden information and the hands-on aspect, um, kind of the, I, I won't call it worker placement, but it's almost a race aspect going down those different spaces to get your resources. Uh, you can get locked out of something you need so easily, and at the same time, you can jump ahead and put yourself in a bad place pretty quickly as well. It was a very interesting, variable, lots of guessing, the whole idea of that reverse bidding auction. Um, it's just, there's so many things you have to keep track of. And at the same time, you really just need to make sure you have enough stuff to do what you want to do. This is a strong buy for me. It is highly recommended. There's an expansion for it that adds the option for two or six players, plus some other cool stuff. Um, I think you should definitely pick that up as well. It, it definitely kind of adds some variety to the game. But even just the base game, which I'm fairly certain is relatively inexpensive if you buy it online, um, is a must. This is this was a lot of fun. And I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I hadn't played it sooner because it's been out for a few years now. Yeah, so I do have Francis, Francis Drake on my shelves, and I'm kind of in a similar position of, boy, I wish I had played this game. I really want to play this game. It looks like a great game, and I have still yet to actually get it out. I actually even have one of the expansions for it, so hearing your your good experience is going to continue to make me feel even more guilty about not having played Francis Drake. But no, it, it does seem like a really excellent game, and, and hopefully I'll be able to join you in the, the hall of people who have played the game soon enough. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You should definitely give it a go when you have a chance. It's um, I'm not going to say it's a steep learning curve, but it did take a little bit of time to learn, and there are some fiddly bits. Uh, just because there's so much going on. Also, the setup of the road with all the different action spaces on it can be kind of a headache because it changes based on the number of players, then you randomize it, and the game comes packed with German tiles. So if you don't remove those, you might accidentally put out a German tile, um, which doesn't really matter because it's all iconography, but it could be confusing. So um, other than that, though, like everything else here, and the production quality is ridiculous. You have these little crates that you have for supplies uh you have these little ships that can be upgraded to bigger ships the treasure chests that you build out of cardboard the board is man just fantastic looking even the box has uses the thickest cardboard i think i've ever seen on a game board game box uh it's just kind of blown away with like how much production quality went into this it's up there with you know age of empires the, the new version that they put out um recently in terms of quality I don't remember if this was kickstarted originally, but it certainly seems like it based on how much is packed in here. So it's a good one. All right. And the last game I wanted to talk about, um, this is another one grabbed at uh, Gen Con this year, is Merck's Recon Assassination Protocol. Um, this was kickstarted back in 2014. And there's actually two games here that were kickstarted together. There was Assassination Protocol and Counter Threat. They're both cooperative games in the Merck's universe. I think they just have different sets of mercs, the different teams in them. Um, probably different, you know, tiles and stuff that go with them as well. Uh, the game shipped, I think, earlier this year. It was a little delayed because of some miniature problems. Basically, what it is, is you are building your own board. So it's very variable. There's a lot of tiles that come in the box. You do need a lot of space to set this up. It's a very large board. Um, I didn't measure it, but it kind of leaned off the edge of my table. And my table can handle most games that I own. So I was a little surprised how big it was. And it's it says co-op and it's supposed to be quick and easy, but it really is more of a tactical skirmish game. It is more in line with their actual Mercs team on team games. There are several missions you can tackle. It does play solo very well. And the goal of the game is that you're going to break into a space. It's an interior space, unlike the main game. Fight through hallways, capture and interrogate different people uh, and track down different objectives. And then hopefully by the end, secure the mission objective. What makes it interesting and different is you have this reach and clear mechanic, which basically you're just building up this kind of crescendo at the end of the game, which involves a lot of dice rolling, considering how tactical the rest of the game is. It's I wasn't sure if it really fit thematically with the, how the rest of the game played, but it was still fun. So I'm kind of torn on it. Uh, you know, I definitely want to give it some more goes after the couple times I've played it. It works, but it just 
it doesn't 100 percent fit with how i feel the game was moving um thematically the modular game board though means you know you get a different play style every single time the ai here is pretty good it's very aggressive so you're constantly facing stuff you can't just sit back and wait for things to happen and then the play time is pretty quick they advertise less than an hour which i think is a little aggressive it's probably closer to 75 to 90 minutes most of the time unless you're soloing it but that's still pretty good considering the scope of the game and how much is out there now some of the issues that i had here it is from a miniatures company so when you open the box you take everything out the miniatures are not assembled at all uh there are no pictures of the miniatures there's no instructions on assembly they have videos on their website for how things go together but if you're not used to assembling miniatures if you're a board gamer you're going to open this and just sigh you're like uh i'm not doing this and they don't just snap together you need glue so you might not even have the resources to do it now i mean the odds of someone picking up this particular game if they've never if they're not into miniatures i'm not sure what that might be because it's part of a miniature line but that was a potential issue uh i know for a lot of people a couple of other things the rules are not super super clear it's not like myth 1.0 bad but there are some areas where things are a little ambiguous the game has a lot of depth to it there's a lot going on it's very tactical so some things are just not covered very well the the rule book is also very busy there's images everywhere the text is not clearly laid out sometimes so Every rule is probably in the book, but you will be flipping back and forth to find everything because it's not that long of a rule book. So it is a bit of a mess, but not so bad that you can't learn the game and play it. I would definitely recommend, though, if you had this and you were learning it, just use the videos. They're pretty good. They'll get you through the game because it's not that complex of a game. This is not like trying to learn myth where there's so much going on and the rule book makes it impossible. Um, it just ends up being a little bit of a, a little wonky. So basically, I mean, I'm in the middle on this. If you're looking for something fast with miniatures that's relatively lighter in the middle, it's solo co-op, um, this is not that kind of game at all. Uh, some of the language on the box and kind of the presentation might make you think it is that kind of game, and it's, it's just not. You have to assemble the miniatures. The rules aren't super clear. It takes up a ton of space, and it's very tactical. Now, for a lot of people, all those things are fine. If you're a miniatures player then it's might be okay for you it's it's deeper it's tactical if you are into tabletop miniature games that are more tactical you know not not as big and epic as some of the bigger ones but kind of in the middle then this is a easy way to get into that uh but it is a board game so i'm i'm kind of wondering when they made this like who it's for i know the kickstarter came with both of these games and then a bunch of other additional uh mercs you know groups that you could have and then there's the mercs 2.0 rulebook uh, which we also have a copy of that i mean i'm taking a look through which offers different game modes but for a board gamer and for somebody who's not used to miniatures and kind of all the caveats that go with that um i would say this is a dodge if you are a miniature gamer and you're looking for a board game that kind of bridges that gap that allows you to play something more tactical and utilize these kind of miniatures and have that level of detail to it without necessarily having to break everything out and have a four hour game, but also not so light like a zombie side or something, um, then it's probably a play. Uh, it's a good game. It's just the audience is probably very small for this. So uh, there you have it. Mercs, uh, Recon. This was Assassination Protocol, but uh, rule sets basically the same for the uh, the other version of the game. Well, at least I'm glad to see that they're branching out to the board game area. I mean, these miniatures are high quality. The stories, the books are really nice. Probably a little bit further they need to go, would you say? Yeah, I think so. I think they could have, if they were going to do this, I think what they should have done is just make a straight board game where you can showcase those miniatures or not, sure. you know, make it super duper heavy and just make it very clear on the box it's like you're getting into something here like this is not a 60 minute game they, sure. they kind of straddle both lines and the result is a game that's good but the audience like who's going to want to play it i you know there's a limited group of people i'm almost in that group and i'm just not quite and i like solo games i started a solo gaming podcast and i'm just still just <laughs> you know the have it the the barrier here and the comparison to other games like it, it just makes it not quite something that's going to fit in my rotation. 
All right, so that's everything that's hitting our table this week. And now, BGA's feature review. We're going deep cover favorite. The game that's kind of blowing out records in 2016, that's Code Names by Vlado Shavalto. Now, you've seen this game in Target. You've heard us talk about Code Names pictures that recently came out. This game is hitting families' tables. This is hitting gamers' table. This is the party game that everyone is really talking about and playing. So what is Codenames? Well, if you haven't been one of the millions of people that has been picking this game up, Codenames is basically you are looking at 25 cards, and on each of the cards is a code name. Now, the code name is either related to an agent on your team or an agent on the opponent's team. Now, there's also an assassin in this game, which you definitely don't want to have flipped over. And, of course, there's some innocent bystanders. So, what's going to happen is one person on your team is going to give a clue that's going to relate to one of the code names or multiples of the code names. And then the other part of the team is going to guess which of the code names relates to the opponent's teams to kind of knock out those secret agents. Now, at the same time, they're hopefully avoiding innocent bystanders and the assassin because if your team picks the assassin you lose the entire game so hopefully the person giving the clues is giving clues good enough that you can guess multiple people in this game of the other team it goes back and forth until you name all of the opponent's secret agents and then you win the game it's a pretty light quick game but it plays with a large number of people and for us serious gamers You kind of really get into it as trying to get the perfect word that's going to give you multiple agents at the same time. Now, if you're on the part of the team that's waiting for the clues, it does take a while. We've already reviewed this game, but we want to take codenames that's so popular and let you know what other games, what deeper games that you can play that are based upon some of the great mechanics of codenames. So, Daniel, why don't you start us off? So Codenames is a great game in that there is an incredibly specific but thorough category that we could expand into here, which is hint-driven deduction party games. And so that's the category I really want to focus on here, right? So Codenames is a lot of sort of that sort of process of very subtle hinting back and forth. You don't want to give away too much or be too obvious, but you do need to share information. Uh, and there are a couple of games that I think capture this sort of limited information sharing very well. Uh, probably the most familiar uh, and actually arguably simpler than code names is Dixit. Well, probably not simpler, but about as simple. Uh, Dixit and its many variations, as many of you are probably familiar with, uh, you have these various sort of art pictures and you describe them in terms that are meant to be specific enough that at least one person can identify it correctly, but not so specific that everyone can identify it correctly. Because if everyone gets it right, you don't get any points. And if no one gets it right, you don't get any points. Uh, So you want to try to hit that middle ground. Uh, And so in that way, Dixit's very similar to code names in that you don't want to give away everything, but you want to make sure that you're still communicating. Now, in that case, one difference is that with Dixit, there really aren't teams, whereas in Codenames, right, you've got a person you're working alongside. Um, But the general gameplay, uh, if you want a sort of free-for-all version of this, uh, Dixit's a great place to go, and there are so many beautiful variations of Dixit. The art is wonderful, uh, and it's just a, a good next game, and it's honestly something you probably ought to have on your shelf in some form or another. After that, I think we can expand a somewhat more complicated hint-giving game. And so I think Mysterium's another good choice here. Mysterium is kind of like Dixit plus Clue with a little bit of a supernatural element in it. So the idea is that you are you're playing as a team of supernatural investigators with paranormal powers, sort of vague psychic impressions. And there is a spirit in this house who is trying to tell you about various murders that have happened and help you figure out who goes with who. So that's the clue-like element, which is what person, what weapon, etc. Mysterium has a lot of the same sort of beautiful, surreal art that Dixit has. And it also has the sort of limited hint giving. Now, one of the things that Mysterium does that 
neither Dixit nor Codenames does, right? There's really no communication in one direction. I guess the only feedback you get back is that you got a wrong answer from the ghost, who is one of the players. Uh, otherwise, it's all very much just sort of deduction and elimination uh, and trying to interpret properly these sort of ambiguous images that you've been handed by the ghost and the end forms of visions. So I think Mysterium is another great game to go into if you're interested in code names. Uh, it has a lot of the merits of Dixit in that it's beautiful. It really is just sort of these beautiful surreal artworks. I actually like it a little bit more because you get that cooperative gameplay going on, which puts pressure on you in a way that I feel like Dixit doesn't. But if you really don't want that sort of pressure in a sort of casual game environment, then maybe Mysterium is not as good for you. I definitely had moments playing Mysterium where I'm sitting down there with the last clue to solve and right before the game is over and, you know, half the table is yelling at me to pick one thing and the other half to pick the other and I'm just going, oh god, which I enjoy in a game, but you may not. The last game I'm going to recommend you take a look at if you like these sort of hint-driven deduction games is going to be The Resistance. Uh, now, The Resistance is a game where you're, it essentially, it's a mission completion game. The main team wins if they complete a certain number of missions. However, they've been infiltrated and there are people who work against them who can cause them to lose missions. Uh, and these people win if you don't, if the main team, quote unquote, doesn't win, right? If the operatives lose, the infiltrators win. So, uh, in playing The Resistance, you have to do a lot of signaling about what team you're on. And it's actually pretty tricky. If you're too obvious, especially as one of the, the spies, the infiltrators, you're going to get destroyed right away. Right? They're just going to avoid you forever. You're out of the loop. You're not going to be able to help your team uh, trip up the enemy. Likewise, if you're uh, uh, too obvious uh, about your uh, team affiliation as a member of the, the operatives, you're actually probably going to look like you're one of the spies. Uh, because they are always proudly and prolifically proclaiming that they are not spies. Uh, Resistance is also very similar to Avalon, so if you've played that, you know what's going on here. All three of these games I like as follow-ups to code names because they're hint-driven and sort of deduction information-driven games. They're all pretty light, so if you want something to sort of move slightly forward and wait, but you don't want to suddenly hit the heavy end of deduction games, and boy, is the heavy end of deduction games heavy, uh, they're a good follow-up in that regard. And I think, generally speaking, the people who like code names are going to like Mysterium, Dixit, and Resistance for the very same reasons, right? Because it's a light deduction game played with friends and it can handle a lot of players. So those are my recommendations. If you like code names, try Mysterium, Dixit, and Resistance. How about you, Anthony? What are your recommendations? For me, I mean, when I think of code names, I definitely think of, you know, the deduction aspect and, you know, some of the stuff that Chris is going to talk about as well. But another big part of it, and one of the reasons I like the game, uh, especially from the, the guessing side, is the word aspect. Uh, you know, having to come up with a single word that encompasses what several different words mean in a way that also excludes certain other words. It's just it's very it can be very difficult, but it's also a lot of fun. It's like this little puzzle you have to work out. So I like word games quite a bit. And it's one of the reasons I'm drawn to this. So I wanted to talk about three word games that uh, kind of fit the same. I wouldn't say necessarily the same weight, but maybe the same amount of time and kind of mental <laughs> amount of effort that needs to go in. The first of those is by far my favorite word game, uh, at least in the strategy realm. I am a big Scrabble fan, I will say that, but I'm not going to put that on here because that's a whole nother beast, <laughs> a different kind of game. But in terms of like a modern game that kind of captures that, I think Paperback does it best. Definitely the best word game I've played in recent years and probably the best deck building game I've played in recent years as well. Uh, so the idea of the game is you have different letters in your hand and you'll be spending points based on the words that you make with those letters to buy new letters into your hand. Some of those letters have special abilities on them that let you do additional things or increase the points you get. And then it, eventually you'll be using the words that you build with your hand to purchase different victory point cards. There's also special uh, bonuses you can get for being the first person to you know, put out a seven, eight, nine, or 10 letter word. And then once all, once the longest word has been built kind of on that chart going down, um, once you get up to 10, then the game is over and everybody counts up their victory points. 
It is fairly quick. I just explained pretty much all the rules, so it's fairly simple as well. And it does have a bit of a take that element, which is something you wouldn't necessarily expect from a, a word game, but I think it works really well here. It can be tough for people who, you know, don't like word games, don't enjoy Scrabble, don't like putting words together. But if you do it all and you want something a little meatier with some strategy to it, paperback is really, really good. So that's probably the heaviest of the recommendations I'm going to make here and kind of, you know, two or three steps beyond code names. But I could kind of see them being part of the same game night. You know, people, if you're getting together to play social word games, these go together quite well. The next one here is quite a bit simpler, um, uh, definitely on the lighter side. It takes a little bit longer than, you know, I might like for this kind of game. And that's really just because of the number of rounds that you play. And that's Quiddler. So Quiddler is, it's a game that plays over eight rounds with one to eight players. So that bit right there kind of makes it interesting because it plays up to eight and it works very well with eight. And what you do is on each round, you're going to draw, you're going to have a certain number of cards and you're going to draw a new card every time it comes around to your turn and then discard another card. And the goal is to be the first person to use all of the cards in your hand with one left over for discarding to spell words. So they can be multiple words um, with at least, at least two letters each, uh, two cards each, or it can be one really long word. Early on, it's fairly straightforward because you only have a handful of cards. But as you get on to the later rounds and you have you know eight, nine, ten cards in your hand, it gets much more difficult. Uh, the person with the longest word is going to get 10 bonus points each time. And then there is bonuses as well available for like the most number of words and other things. There's also different variants here for how you can um, kind of score it out as you go around. So it's very interesting. It does drag a little bit towards the end because you have eight full rounds of this. And more often than not, the person who puts out several smaller words is going to do better than the person who keeps trying to think of the one really long word that uses all eight letters. Uh, but I enjoy it quite a bit. And it's a good social game that gives you a chance to kind of cycle through letters until you have what you need to build a word out. Um, and it's a lot of fun for that reason. So it's probably the most accessible and lightest weight of these games that I'd recommend. And then the third game is a relatively new one. Uh, and this is it's an interesting game because the designer is Matt Leacock, who is well known for his pandemic and Forbidden Desert and Island and all things cooperative. Uh, but this is a very cute little word game, uh, very, very cool production value. It's got the magnetic flip top. It's got these beautiful little uh, thread spools. It's got these little uh, clothespins that are used to clip on the words. And that is Knitwit. So Knitwit is fairly simple and it's it actually kind of takes the more interesting aspect of code names and turns it into a group activity which i find very fun what what will happen is every round each player has to take their string uh, it's going to be a loop of string and place it over at least one other spool that is on the table so you can choose any spool you want you'll situate your str string in a way that it covers other strings and then you have to put your spool inside of that somewhere. So what you're doing is you're creating kind of this multi-layered Venn diagram where all these different loops overlap each other. And then you're going to attach a word onto the where you placed yours. And you're basically creating situations where each different spool is within multiple different words. So, you know, the blue spool might be within, you know, wet flammable and interesting, you know, at three different words that are out there. And so what will happen is once everybody's done that, you'll have your little piece of paper and you have to think of a word or something that kind of captures all three of those accurately. So everybody will race to do that. You have a limited amount of time and it can be a word. It can be a name. It can be a phrase, anything that kind of captures all three of those things together. So it's got that aspect of code names, except Everybody's doing it at the same time and you're all rushing. Um, the interesting thing about it is that if more than one person chooses the same thing as an answer, nobody gets any points for that. So it might be, oh, this is a this is a perfect answer. I, I just thought of the exact thing that I need to answer for this. But somebody else also thought of the exact same thing. No matter how clever it is, you both kind of, it's a wash. Uh, so 
it's very interesting. It's very quick. Uh, the social aspect is a lot of fun. I like, too, that it's got this little, like, chalkboard-style paper that you write on. And you can play the game in, you know, maybe 20 minutes or so. So that is Nitwit. Uh, I think this captures that aspect of code names where you're trying to capture those words and what they mean all together quite, quite well. So this one's a lot of fun. And it looks so pretty on the board. So, yeah, those are the three games that I think if you like the word aspect of code names, if you like that puzzling, figuring out how to put all those words together, these are three games that you might also like. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, what about your group? Well, for my category, what I really love about code names is the fact that there is information or hidden information from your team that on some level the person who's giving the clues trying to communicate and yeah you're getting a sense of it you figured out at least some part of it or you have a general vague idea of what it may be but now it comes down to a press your luck type of mechanic so it's not just the normal press your luck where you're rolling dice or you're deciding to keep flipping cards but the press your luck is based upon that clue, that hidden information. Now, we already talked about the usual suspects and how it's a co-op game where one of your partners is giving a clue and you're choosing the suspects that you want to flip over. So you could just pick one and be done with it, but you're usually going to pick more than one, just like in code names where you're going to pick out multiple code name words to flip over. So the question is, how far do you go? How far... Is that clue giving you inf real information that you can play off? So Unusual Suspects does a really great job of that. But there is also another game that uses this mechanic is actually called The Game. Now in The Game, you are, you are given a handful of cards. And the object of the game is to get rid of not just the cards in your hand, but the entire deck. So there are two piles that start off with 99 and there are two piles that start off with 0. So you have to play cards on those piles, but since everyone has number cards in their hands, the better you can play those cards together in a row, the more likely you are to get rid of all the cards in that game and then win the game. So each time you play a card, you can give a subtle clue or hint that's not based upon the numbers, but gives information to the other players about generally what your status may be. So you can play one card. Well, I don't think that they have a 68. So I can play a 67, a 66, and a 65. Maybe I could play a 64, but maybe I'm pushing that too far. So once again, it's a quick playing card game like Code Names, but it's all based upon what information can you derive from what your other teammates are giving you. Now another game, even a deeper game, that plays that mechanic probably to the best possible way is the grizzled now this is another co-op game in which you're playing cards and try and play cards in concert with your other players so here in this game you are trying to play symbols that are unlike the other player symbols because if you play three of the same type of symbols then the round ends and you lose that round and bad stuff occurs so what you want to do is play symbols in such a way that you're giving information, whether you're playing traumas against yourself because you really don't want to play a card, or you're playing cards that gives the other players a sense that all of those cards that type have now been played. Once again, it's limited hidden information that your other players have that you want to communicate in a way that's fair to the rules, but nonetheless, how far do you go? How many cards do you play on, on your hand? Or do you stop at some point and then gain more cards in order to play another round? So sometimes it's better to retreat and fight again another day. So all these three games, the Unusual Suspects, the Game, and the Grizzled, all play this mechanic as far as having information from one of your teammates, trying to communicate that the best way possible and then you on your end playing as many cards as possible in order to win the game all right so those are three types of mechanics that you can find in code names and nine types of games that you can play with your friends that who really enjoyed code names and maybe get them out into some deeper hobby board games all right so that's everything for this week please keep in contact with us on Facebook, Twitter, 
BoardGamersAnonymous.com, our brand new and ever-growing YouTube channel. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. The more ratings we get, the more board gaming comes up in the hobby. And don't forget our Patreon account. A little bit of money goes a long way getting these new episodes out to you each and every month. Until next time, this is Chris. This is Anthony. And this is Daniel. And Daniel will volunteer us to save you a seat at the table. <laughs>